Alrighty. So hi, everyone. Welcome to the last October outreach session. All the student presenters today are a part of the Mates Division of Project Terrapin. We'll be presenting about turtles, fact, fiction, and fun. Specifically, we'll dive heavily into the Diamondback Terrapin. We hope you enjoy, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. So first off, I'm going to be talking about some of the general information about turtles. So just to start off, turtles are actually one of the oldest living reptiles, which means that they're cold-blooded. So turtles actually live in almost every single continent and habitat type. And there are three types of turtles, which are sea turtles, tortoises, and terrapins. And the difference between those types of turtles are just going to be where they spend most of their life, either, either on the water or the land. So next, I would just like to point out that most all turtles have a hard shell that's going to be attached to them and it's actually going to grow with them. And then most turtles can actually retract their heads in, and their limbs into their shells. And then one last general information about turtles is that they actually lay their eggs and then bury them with the sand, and then the mothers do not stay to nurture their young. So then on the next slide, we just have some pictures of the types of turtles and terrapins. So just to start off, I'm going to tell you the seven species of turtles, which are going to be the Kemp's Ridley, Loggerhead, Green Sea Turtle, Leatherback, Hawksbill, Olive Ridley, and the Flatback. And as you can see, many of them are shown in the pictures on the top row. And the bottom are just some other common types of turtles that are going to live on the land, mostly. And so just a little bit of information about them. The box turtle, which is the one all the way to the left, is a type of reptile that is belongs to a group of marsh turtles and there are actually six subspecies of box turtles in North America and the box turtles they actually inhabit woodlands, uh, brushy grass grasslands, meadows and other areas near streams and ponds. The next picture to the right of the box turtle is actually the red-eared slider and they're a medium-sized freshwater turtle that can grow between 125 to 200 millimeters long and the uh, just some common characteristics is that the carapace and the skin is olive to brown with yellow stripes or spots and the next turtle after that is actually the painted turtle and just an important fact about that is that the males are smaller than the females and they're recognized as one of the be most beautiful colored species and then the picture all the way to the right is the northern diamondback terrapin and so our presentation and the rest of it is going to focus actually a lot of it on the northern diamondback terrapin so i'll let you hear more about information about that in a little bit so then the next slide is going to just talk about the different turtle habitats between sea turtles and terrapins and land turtles so the left side is going to be the sea turtles. So sea turtles basically live in the open oceans and they are going to nest on tropical and subtropical subtrop beaches. And you can usually spot them in coral reefs and seagrass beds. And then to the right, you have the terrapins and land, land turtles. So they can live in a variety of environments on the land, but most of the common ones would be moist forests and wetlands and deserts. And then many of the terrapins, which we'll discuss in a little bit, live in brackish coastal estuaries. So brackish water just means that they're going to live in a mix of fresh and salt water. And just the turtle habitats can be seen in the pictures below it. As you can see, the sea turtle is living in the open ocean, but the terrapin is going to be on the land. And then the next slide is actually going to highlight the northern diamondback terrapin which has a scientific name, Malapamese terrapin terrapin. And you can see many pictures of it on the right side of the screen. And you'll get to learn a lot more about the Northern Diamondback terrapin, which is such an important species to conserve. And there's a lot of interesting stuff to learn about. So in regards to habitat, Northern Diamondback terrapins are special. They're the only type of turtle to live in brackish water, which is basically water that is saltier than fresh water, but not quite to the extent of salt water. And more specifically, they in inhabit salt marshes, tidal reefs, and estuaries, which are bodies of water of brackish water that form the border between rivers and streams and the sea. And 
Females prefer nesting in open sandy areas. So next slide, uh, it's about range and location. So Northern Diamondback Terrapins live along the coast of the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico in the US, which would essentially be the, north, the Eastern and Southern coast of the US. And in New Jersey, they're found in estuaries beside the coast, but more prominently in Delaware, in the Delaware and Barnegat Bays. So on the next slide, there are physical characteristics of turtles. Uh, so on their shell, they have scutes. Uh, there are the scutes, bridge, and flash, plastron, and carapace. The, plast the plastron being at the bottom of the turtle, and the carapace being the top of its shell. So usually the carapace is black, brown, or dark gray, and the plastron is light green or yellow. Uh, uh, their skin is light gray and has black specks with its shell being streamlined for, fat, for fast swimming. And their feet are webbed and clawed, which is unique to carabins in terms of turtles. And lastly, their scutes are made from keratin. So for the next slide, you can see that diagrams of turtles with its carapace. You can see it, it's being, it being the top of the turtle's shell and the plastron being the bottom of its shell with its bridge being arrowed to the, uh, accordingly to the diagram and scutes being those little um, portions of its of the turtle shell. So on the next slide, there are, shows the size and uh, sexual dimorphism. Okay, so first off, the sex of a terrapin is determined by the temperature at which the egg is incubated at. So if an egg in the nest is anywhere below 82 degrees Fahrenheit, that egg is going to hatch to be a male. Whereas if it is above 86 degrees Fahrenheit, that egg is going to hatch and be a female. And anywhere in between that range of temperatures, it's a 50-50 chance of whether it's going to be male or female. And sexual dimorphism refers to when a species, you can visibly tell by looking at it if it is a male or if it is a female. So we're going to talk, to talk about how we can tell those differences between male and female terrapins, because they determine obviously their physical characteristics. So starting off with the female, she will have a larger shell and head, but a short and narrow tail. She also ha has a rounder carapace, and she's typically going to be six to nine inches long, whereas males are a lot smaller. There are shells in their heads, but they have the longer and thicker tails, and they have a flatter carapace, and they're going to range anywhere from four to five and a half inches long. The reason that the female is going to be larger is to um, house those eggs, because uh, she has to be larger to hatch, uh, to hold the eggs. So then on the next slide, we're going to discuss the terrapins, like how to identify them if you come across them in the wild or if you're walking on a path or something of that sort. So again, like we mentioned previously with their physical characteristics, you look for those, those dark markings on the gray skin and in the picture to the right, you can see, you get a really good picture of that dark gray skin with all of the little dots of um, black that are going to be on them. Those are those dark markings. And then you can look at the dark carapace and the light plastron. Um, again, we talked about before, the plastron is going to be that lighter color. And then on the top, they're going to have the dark carapace with the diamond-shaped pattern on them, which is what the diamondback terrapin is named after because they have diamonds on their back. You want to think of the um, carapace as a back. And again, on the picture, you can really see the definition of those lines. So then we're going to move on to the next slide, which is talking about their diet. So with relation to a terrapin's diet, terrapins are opportunistic feeders. This means that terrapins are generally going to eat what's most accessible to them and what they can get the easiest. Uh, however, adult terrapins tend to eat four main groups of food as their sources of nutrition. So the first is fish. Adult terrapins eat 
uh, mainly smaller fish. Uh, and this type of fish depends on where they're located. Um, they also eat mollusks. Uh, so this includes mussels, clams, and oysters. And again, depending on uh, where they are residing in will depend on what they eat for their food on um, the mollusk category. Uh, they eat crustaceans, which are uh, mainly crab, shrimps, uh, and krill, which they use to feed on, and carrion, which is decaying flesh of dead animals. Captive terrapins uh, eat turtle pellets, which are similar to fish pellets that you would normally feed your fish, but they're larger in size, uh, contain nutrients that are essential for a terrapin's growth. And they also eat frozen shrimp, which is harder to find usually in the wild for uh, many terrapins, but it does have uh, nutrition uh, and benefits for the terrapin that was unable to be accessed uh, in the wild. And hashlings uh, eat fiddler crabs mainly, which are only two to three inches in size, which is a lot smaller than a crab you may be envisioning. Uh, but it's good for hatchlings because they are smaller in size and it's easier for them to eat. They also eat shrimp, uh, like captive terrapins, and they eat plants as well, which is unlike adult terrapins or captive terrapins. Uh, so on the next slide, I'm going to be talking about some of the predators that terrapins face. So terrapins and their eggs are targeted by many different predators on types of animals. So the first I'm going to be talking about are raccoons. Raccoons are special because they carry the turtles and their eggs to a safe spot and then eat them. So that way the raccoons cannot be harmed while they're eating the terrapins uh, and the terrapins also have less of a chance to escape. Uh, next, foxes prey on turtles um, and they are different from raccoons uh, in terms of preying on their terrapins because they're a lot less careful uh, with their prey. So they will uh, normally sneak up behind a terrapin or sometimes not even sneak up because terrapins are too slow to get away from the fox and the fox will uh, eat the terrapin. So otters, similar to terrapins, are opportunistic feeders uh, and they primarily feed on fish. However, they will eat terrapins as well uh, if that's what's around them because they will eat generally whatever they can find. And lastly, uh, birds are also a main predator of turtles. Um, seabirds have an advantage over birds that mainly live on the land because they're better adapted to uh, targeting these turtles and they have strategies that are better for obtaining the turtles as a source of food. So next, we're going to be talking about the terrapin tree production and nesting. So terrapins um, reach matur maturity at different times depending on their sex. So the males reach maturity between five to eight years old and females between nine to 10 years old. And once they reach that age, they are ready to reproduce. Terrapins mate in the water, usually at night, and the females go up to the beach to lay their eggs in shallow nests, which they dig into the sand, like you can see in the picture on the right. They lay between 8 and 15 eggs in a brood, and they nest between June and July. And they can nest several times a year over the summer, but because only around 1 to 3% of the eggs laid actually produce a hatchling. So they want to lay more broods so that they have a higher chance of getting hatchlings. The eggs are around 1 inch long, and they're pink in color. So on the next slide, you can see the different hatchlings. And so the eggs hatch after six, 60 to 100 days around August to September. And the like we said before, the temperature of when the eggs hatch into hatchlings determines the gender. And after hatching, they immediately go to the vegetation so that they won't be eaten or killed by any predators. But still, the surviving survival rate of hatchlings making it to adulthood is only negative one percent or about one percent. So on the next slide we can see notching. Notching is when we take a terrapin shell and we put little notches into it. So the carapace um doesn't have any nerves in it so they won't feel it. And each scoot around the outer edge is corresponds with a letter between A through X. 
And you can tell because you start at the nuchal, which is the tiny middle scoot all the way at the top. So on the picture, you can see that that terpen has a code that corresponds to the four notches. And this is used to identify and track the turtles in order for research or conservation efforts. On the next slide, we can go to ways to measure a terrapin. So the length of a terrapin is the straight carapace length. So you just measure from the um, nuchal all the way to the back of the shell, from the anterior to the posterior. And the width is the carapace width of the shell. So you just measure the longest part of the shell. And the plastron length is from the anterior to posterior part of the plastron. And the height is just the vertical height of the shell. So how exactly we get these measurements? We use a caliper or a tape measure. Um, at Mates, we actually do all of the measurements on our terrapins and our hatchlings ourselves using these instruments. So the caliper, you put the top of the um, bar you can see it in the picture and you pull the bottom down until you measure each of those widths discussed in the last slide and then you record it. Um, and then to weigh, we just use a scale. We wipe it down. Um, we put the terrapin on it, measure it, record it, take it off, clean the balance, and then go from there. So now we're going to take a look at some fun facts dealing with the diamondback terrapins. So they have one of the longer lifespans um, considering you know, their size and everything. They live for about 25 to 40 years. Um, they also hibernate, hibernate during the winter. They submerge themselves in the sediment to try to trap the warmth, which is why they submerge themselves. And you can determine the terrapin's age by counting the growth rings on its scoots. And they are extremely strong swimmers due to their webbed feet and strong legs. And they are also the only turtle to live in brackish waters. Brackish referring to that there is a greater influx of fresh water than salt water. Um, so it's a mix, but there is more fresh water present, which is why we find so many terrapins nesting in the marshes along the Barnegat Bay because it meets that brackish water requirement. So some of the environmental stressors for terrapins are that they are affected by climate change and the rise in sea level. It destroys their habitat and it changes the ecosystem of the salt marshes. Um, and other factors in their loss of habitat is runoff in the waterway, pollutants, dredging, and development. Increased temperature and change in water quality also, in, and increasing water activity also are environmental stressors. And Next, their conservation status. Um, in the United States, the northern diamondback terrapin is listed as a near-threatened species, and in New Jersey, the northern diamondback terrapin is listed as a species of special concern. On the next slide, we discuss BRDs, which are also known as bycatch reduction devices. So BRDs basically are used as an attachment on crab pots, and they act as a barrier to physically block bycatch from entering the pot. So basically what happens is terrapins would get stuck in these crab pots and since they're unable to escape, they result in them drowning and dying. And that is not good because as we discussed earlier, they are a species of special concern. So as a way, as a conservation effort, BRDs were invented. So BRDs basically prevent terrapins from entering. And if the terrapins can enter, they make sure the terrapins can leave. So this dramatically helps in, helps with the terrapin populations as the terrapins can no longer get stuck or if they can, they can escape. On the next slide, we discuss another conservation, conservation effort, which is the terrapin barrier fences. So thousands of terrapins are killed each year in Atlantic and Cape May count, counties. And many of these terrapin deaths are directly of a result from road mortality. So fences are used in order to keep the terrapins blocked into a specific location or prevent them from entering the roadways. So one of these types of fences include silt fencing, which is basically a black tarp with pieces of wood in order to hold it up to create a fence. While this fence has a low cost and high availability, 
but it is known as being less durable, unable to subsept to damage as if like in a heavy windstorm or rain or snow events, m much of this fence is destroyed. Additionally, it's also known as being one of the unattractive fence options. So therefore it is not really used, but if a fence is needed, it is a great alternative to use. The next fence is the Tenax har hardware fence, which is exactly as it sounds. It is basically, basically it is a net fencing made of plastic. It can also be made of wire. And it is shown in the image above on the top on the right hand side. And so basically this fence has a year round durability. It is a reasonable cost. It is a bit more expensive than the silt fencing, but it is still reasonable pricing. And it also has an improved appearance. So it's not as, it, all, it is not that attractive to say. It is much more basically prettier to look at than the silt fencing. It has little degre degradation from the wet, from weather events, but it can have damage due to snow events making it another option that is better than silt fencing, but there still can be something that is better, which leads us to the corrugated tube. So basically the corrugated tubing barrier is just one large piece of tubing. It is much quicker and easier to install than either of the fencing mentioned earlier. Its flexibility allows it to conform to a longer range, but due to locally uneven terrain, sometimes gaps can form with this fence and the terrapins can easily sneak through, making it basically useless as a fence because the fences are supposed to make sure the terrapins don't go through. So that is one problem of this, this fence. And additionally, the prices of this fence may rise with the prices of oil because sometimes this tubing is used for oil. And additionally, terrapins are known to nest under the fence, they burrow under. So again, making this type of fence sometimes useless. But there are other ways you can help, which are discussed on the next slide. So some ways you can help. You can look for terrapin road signs and be cautious when driving. So basically, whenever you see a sign that is shown in the middle picture on the right, make sure you're cautious when driving because terrapins can easily go on the roadways. So, and as I discussed earlier, road mortality is one of the leading causes of terrapin deaths. So make sure you watch out when driving or when you see this up, see this line, make sure to inform a parent that there's terrapins in the area. Another way you can help out is volunteering. Just helping spread the word to make everyone more aware that, about these terrapins is a great way to be involved and how you can help. Additionally, when fishing, be sure to remove your crab pots from the water because terrapins can easily get stuck and drown as discussed in the BRD section of this PowerPoint. And when using types of crab pots, such as commercial style crab pots, make sure you use the BRDs. And a lot of the times you can find BRD distribution centers all around Ocean County and they give you BRDs for free. So make sure when you're using commercial style crab pots to grab some of these BRDs so the terrapins don't get stuck and drown. Another way is to spread awareness. Just from being in this presentation tonight, you are helping because you can take this information that you learned today because you have all the basic information you really need about terrapins and you can spread this to everyone. You can tell your family about it. You can tell your friends. And that is just a way of helping to, for the conservation of this species. Additionally, you can report sightings to help with research. There's a lot of different websites you can report sightings to. So you can easily just look it up, report sightings, and this helps overall with terrapin research. Another way is to support conservation, especially salt marsh conservation, because with the habitat loss, terrapins don't have anywhere to go. So it is important to make sure you support salt marsh conservation so terrapins can have a home. And overall, that concludes conservation. Okay, thank you all for tuning in tonight and spending some of your evening with us. We really appreciate it and we hope that you learned a lot tonight. And also have a great